Hi, this is Humayun Khalili, uh, an emergency cardiologist from Dallas VM at CVI 2017. I'm here with uh, Sway Besaya from uh, Mansfield, Texas, an emergency cardiologist. He's here with a very interesting case of transradial left carotid artery staining. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this case. So this is one of my patients who, who I know for a long time, and I'm actually one of the interventional cardiologists uh, and vascular interventionists in Mansfield, Texas. And this patient, I know her for the last four to five years, and uh, she had prior stenting to the right coronary artery as well as um, uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent stenosis in the left coronary artery that we were following with the ultrasounds. Uh, unfortunately, she was admitted uh, about five or six months ago with a stroke. So she, to begin with, she's a 72 years old female. She was admitted to the uh, uh, Medical Center Arlington Hospital with a syncope and she had a right-sided weakness. Uh, she, f the neurology evaluation suggested that she has a TIA or a small stroke. Along with that, she has an elevated troponin of 2.5. Uh, her past medical history, as I just mentioned, she has a history of hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, COPD, and prior stents to the right, uh, right coronary artery, and she had a history of GI bleed about, I think, three or four months prior to this event. Her physical exam, basically, by the time when I saw her, which was about four or five days after she got admitted, was pretty benign, I mean, except that she has carotid bruise and she has no neurological deficit left. She underwent further evaluation and was noted to be to have a hemoglobin of 13 and hematocrit of 42, platelet count for 364, white count was 8.5. As you noted that her BUN and creatinine were not normal, her creatinine was 1.5, and that's where usually she runs around 1.5 to 1.6. She has chronic renal insufficiency. And her troponin and admission was 2.5. By the time when I was consulted, it was 0.2. She has uh, CAT scan of the head done, which showed no acute stroke. The MRI suggested a small vessel disease, and the CT angiogram of the neck suggested she has an 80% stenosis of the left carotid artery. And the ultrasound of the carotid artery suggested more than 70% stenosis. The cardiac evaluation suggested that her EKG shows no acute STD changes, even on admission or by the time when I saw her, her echocardiogram shows normal ejection fraction, and right-sided pressure were mildly elevated. Uh, her, she underwent a non-invasive evaluation because vascular, medicine, vascular surgery was consulted for possible carotid endarterectomy, and they asked for cardiac evaluation, and the, nu and the nucleus test has suggested that she has a large area of anterior lateral and inferior ischemia with ejection fraction of 66%. As such, she was brought to the cath lab for coronary angiogram first. So we looked at the uh, right coronary artery. She has a pretty severe stenosis of the ostium of the right coronary artery, and a distal left main has a severe stenosis as well. So based on those findings, she was referred to a cardiothoracic surgery consultation for possible cabbage, and she got declined because of her severe carotid stenosis and the recent stroke. And the vascular surgeon obviously did not want to take her to the surgery because of her uh, severe coronary artery disease. So she was then referred back to me for carotid artery stenting. So we, we brought her back to the cath lab. We initially started the case with a right femoral artery approach. That's where I usually start for any carotid artery stenting cases. So as we went in, uh, and I'm, I apologize for the pictures, we did not use the power injector because of the creatinine of 1.6, so I was just doing a hand injection. But even in those pictures, you can easily see that this is a bovine aortic arch. And uh, the bovine arch can be type 1 and type 2. This is a type 2 bovine arch. You can see the takeoff of the uh, left carotid artery is right at 90 degree coming off of the brachycephalic trunk. So when I saw that, I stopped right there and I said, there is no way that for me to stand this artery from the femoral artery approach. We did took some more picture, I think, uh, right there. So we took a picture on the right carotid artery. You can see the most of the fillings of the right hemisphere and also some of the left hemispheric filling was happening through the right carotid artery, suggesting the left carotid stenosis is, severely, is severe and hemodynamically significant because you have a preference flow from the right to left side. In those patients, if we keep the catheter long enough, you know, the longer the catheter manipulation happens, you increase the risk of periprocedure stroke. So we took one or two pictures on the left carotid artery using the Simmons catheter, and you can see it was not even with the Simmons catheter very difficult to access the artery and take pictures, which was not of very good quality. So we then switched to the radial artery. We immediately accessed the right radial artery, and uh, I used the glide wire and the glide catheter to go from the brachiocephalic trunk 
into the uh, okay I'm sorry the picture okay we went into the left common carotid artery and then over the wire we were able to place the six French sheet uh, and we did the selective angiogram you can see the lesion which was pretty severe and I think the next picture you're going to see that uh, the okay this is a picture right there all right well, we have a problem with this okay no problem so anyways so in the left carotid pictures you can you, there was significant underfilling of the m2 m1 and the a1 a2 component of the carot left carotid artery suggesting the most of the filling was happening from the right side so we immediately proceeded with the intervention um, uh, to the left carotid artery patient was anticoagulated with the heparin we initially advanced the distal embolic protection device which was a nef6 uh, we placed it right at the pitreous bone level and then advanced a 5 by 20 milli balloon and performed the pre dilation and the pre post uh, uh, dilation picture shows appropriate pre dilation has been achieved we then advanced the um, self expandable stent exec 60 by 80 by 40 mm and uh, this is a closed cell de uh, uh, design stand which uh, minimize the uh, embolization. So I selected that stand uh, instead of the AccuLink and uh, we were able to get this stand and deployed it successfully. We post dilated this stand using a 6-0 balloon and we had a pretty good results. Uh, at the end, you can see most of the filling now is happening from the left carotid artery. You can see the preferential filling right here the M2, M1 component, and not only that, but it started to fill the, the midline as well. Patient did very well. The entire procedure was done from the radial artery stick to the stent, and the uh, withdrawal of the catheter was within 25 minutes. And the filter time, which uh, I think in this case was close to nine minutes. And as, as you know, the longer the filter time, more than 15 minutes carries a higher risk of periprocedure strokes. So the the, the idea of the, uh, the procedure was that I think the carotid artery standing can be done through the radial art artery approach. Obviously, it's not for every patient. It's designed for patients who have a complex arch or severe calcification because there is a direct correlation between the, the, the longer you stay and manipulate the catheter in the aortic arch and the higher the risk of a stroke is. Yeah. Well, well, thank, thank you. you. And this case would have not been possible without our staff in the hospital. And I'm thankful to all of you as well as them. Thank you very much. It's a great demonstration of uh, carotid artery standing through the radial and very challenging. Um, uh, to those of us who, who don't know, don't do a whole lot of radial cases or, or carotid cases, tell me the difference between the, the bull mine, this type 2 bull mine arch, between type 2 and type 1. Okay, so let's see. I think I have a very nice picture. Where is you had a very nice uh, image of the. Uh, yes, and see if I can arch. bring it back uh, right there. Yeah. So the. Type 1 bovine arch, the left common carotid artery takeoff is right at the junction of the brachiocephalic trunk. And usually, you can still do those cases from the femoral artery. But when you have a type 2 where the, there is a one, man, one centimeter distance between the takeoff of the brachiocephalic and the takeoff of the common carotid, and it's usually 90 degrees turn, it's almost close to impossible. Now, you can still do it, but it's going to take a longer time, a lot of catheter manipulation, and going from the right radial is not a bad deal. I mean, it's pretty easy. Right, simple. right, right. As we know, this is a, a bovine arch. Uh, anatomy in humans is a little bit of misnomer. As, as bovine arch is not really a, uh, a yes. the, the arch in the actual. So bovine, bovine actually does not have that kind right. of anatomy. Bovine is only one big chunk come out, and all the carotids comes out there. But for some reason, this kind of anatomy has been labeled as bovine. Yes, that's right. And a so quick question about the uh, the case from radio. Did you see uh, what was your biggest challenge in, during the whole case? Uh, was it relatively easy to engage you once it went right radial, or? It was pretty simple and easy. The only problem in this case was the patient herself, because patient was still recovering from the stroke. She still was not, uh, at, at, at times she was getting confused. So she was not laying very still, as you can see the images of the, mm -hmm. and the quality of the images. Right. Uh, and you know, during those procedures, I don't like to use any sedations. Mm -hmm. So patient is completely awake. So it was very difficult to keep her hand controlled. Right. And we have to restrain the wrist, but every, at the same time, you have to uh, every two, three minutes ask the patient to do this, to do that, to make sure that they are uh, not having a TI or a strokes. Right. right. But technically, otherwise, it was not. No. I think technically, with this kind of anatomy, the radial approach should be the way to go because it's, right. it's, it's very easy through that. You can see the coming from the radial artery, uh, it's not very difficult to engage the common carotid 
as it comes out from the back cephalic. You can do it by uh, angle glide and glide catheter. And uh, you mentioned the standard use. Uh, why that stent in this particular case? Do you always use this or do you use other stents? Well, no, we use Echolink as well. It depends. I mean, uh, this stent is, is a closed cell design and it does not migrate as much. Mm -hmm. Once you start deploying, it's very little chance that it can move forward on you. The Echolink have a tendency it can move forward on you. Number two, when you deal with the tortu tortuous arch or tortuous anatomy, I want you should uh, you. Sometimes it's difficult to deliver this stent in in tortuous vessels. But once you know that you can get to that point, then I think exact stent is going to deliver exactly where it's going to where you want it to deploy. Number one, number two, because of this closed cell design, there is less chances of uh, showering any microembolization to the brain. So it was perfect, made for this case. All right, thank you very much again for presenting this case. Thank you. Glad to have you here. And this was Human Khalili from CBI 2017.